welcome to episode 31, Esther and Purim, the holiday of Purim. Um, we're going to go into that fun. As Esther is yeah. amazing. It's like, amazing. It's like Ruth. It's yeah. just got so much typology going behind it. So Yeah, and I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And let's just jump right in and get going. To the book of Esther. All right, so we talked about when we did the book of Ruth that the whole story of Ruth was an allegory. It was an allegory of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles, and then that end time when the gospel turns back to the house of Israel at the end of the time of the Gentiles. So comparing the book of Esther with the book of Ruth, Ruth was a Gentile and she would be representing the church and the people of of Christians during this time of the Gentiles when the gospel went to the nations in Acts chapter 2 when the uh, of 12 apostles went out and brought the gospel to the world and in Esther we're going to be dealing with a Jewish woman so right out of the gate you can see that this one is going to be typologically about the time of the restoration of Israel in the end time. Well, and even in the Ezra time, she helped restore. Well, actually, yes, actually, yeah. yes, always, because in every case, there's, there's the, now. the now and then there's the future. Both levels are true. Okay, so Ruth would have been living among the Jews. She was a Gentile that came to Israel and was living among the Jews. Esther is a Jewish woman living among the Gentiles. Okay, that's fun. Ruth married a Jew in a royal line, and Esther marries a Gentile who rules the empire. And so, again, you can see that we're painting this picture of the gospel going to the nations and Ruth coming into Israel. And we have the scattering of Israel amongst the Gentiles here, as seen in Esther in the Persian Empire. Ruth emphasizes the sovereignty of God, the that he is the God of the entire world. And... In Esther, we're going to see that it emphasizes the providence of God, that God is watching over his people. In Ruth, we see that God's name is mentioned frequently. And in Esther, we are going to see that God's name is not mentioned explicitly. So the fun thing here is that um, even though... Martin Luther and Calvin all thought that Esther shouldn't be in the Bible at all because it doesn't mention God. It doesn't mention worshiping the Lord. It doesn't mention any of these things. And that was their point of view. But we're going to see before we're done today that the name of God is in the book of Esther. And Esther actually means hidden. So you're going to have to know how to look to find the name of God in the book of Esther, and we're going to talk about that at the end. Now, both stories, in both cases, it is going to demonstrate that chance, what seems like it might be chance, like Ruth chances upon the field of Boaz, and in the story of Esther, we actually have Haman drawing lots you know, the poor, the poor, and, and that it is by that that he's going to choose the date by chance that they're going to attack the Jews. We're going to see that throughout these stories, it is God working undercover. As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, coincidence is not a kosher word. The Lord is involved, in, and we learn that the Lord is, is involved in the lots. He yeah, the, well, I find that fascinating in the story of of um, Jonah, even right. It, and too? it says that the lot is the Lord, right? Right. It's the Lord's. All right. So the we're going to open up in the book of Esther in chapter one with Vashti the queen, and I and I'm going to assume that most of you know 
the story of Esther. We're not going to cover the whole thing in detail. We're just going to bring out some highlights. And then we're going to move into that hidden part of the book of Esther, where we're going to see how the God is embedded in the inner workings of the book. Okay. To bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, King Xerxes is going to try and get her to come and show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. So you remember this opening up in the book of Esther that Xerxes wants his bride Vashti to come before the those that are gathered for the party. He wants an arm ornament. <laughs> they, they call that arm candy, right? Yeah, arm candy. <laughs> now, it, it's interesting because, you know, the, the, the rabbis and everything, they, they say that this means that he wanted her to come with just her crown to to dance before these the, before these uh, nobles that he has gathered here and uh chronologically in the time period this is part of a feast that Xerxes will throw that is 6 months long he will have all of the nobles coming in from all the different kingdoms for a celebration for six months as he's preparing and rallying all of his provinces to go with him to fight the Greco-Persian wars, the Persian war. So he's, he's, he's whining and dining all of those that he will take with him into heads battle. Heads of state. Heads of state, if you will. Yeah. And, um, and, the, this is really, really a critical time for him to look good. Okay? So um, even though they're all merry with wine, it says in the scriptures, and they're in this huge party that's lasting for six months, um, actually Herodotus, the historian, says that Xerxes was known for his parties. Okay, And... Um, when he asked Vashti to do this, we are told the Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains, and therefore the king was very wroth, and his anger burned in him. So we're going to see that the king is going to take Vashti and have her replaced. So we have a Gentile queen that is going to be replaced with a Jewish queen, just like the time of the Gentiles comes to an end. And in Third Nephi 16, it says that after the time of the Gentiles, it would go back to the house of Israel. So between Esther chapters 1 and 2, there's about a four-year period. And this is going to be when Xerxes is going to uh, execute the Persian Wars. Now, under Darius... We, he went and fought the Battle of Marathon. And the idea here is that they, they are going to try and conquer the world. Alexander the Great did not originate this idea. They, they have... Seems like all of these ancient rulers had a lot of ambition. Exactly. All of these empires wanted to be world rulers. Yeah. They wanted to rule the entire world. And so we're going to have in the, in the... I was thinking, you know... Sometimes we think Hitler was nuts, but, you know, they were all nuts in a way. <laughs> well, and, and we see that in Daniel chapter 2 with, with the statue, with the head of gold. Yeah, and then the a lot of eagles. Silver with the Persian. And these are all people who wanted to be, like these statues needed to be worshipped. And they wanted to, they were world empires. So Darius is going to lose the Battle of Marathon, um, which is about 25 uh, miles northeast of Athens. He's going to lose terribly. He is going to go into battle in some of the accounts. It says he brings in 2 million men. He brings in a huge army and he is going to come back to Persia humiliated with only a few thousand men, like 5,000 men when he returns. So it's this is going to be defeat, a yeah. huge defeat and, and a humiliation for Darius. And so his well, son, Xerxes... It also sets up Alexander the Great revenge, so to speak. Exactly. This is yeah, going to set got, the stage I mean, for essence, Alexander the Great. What they did is tick off the Greeks. Right. Mm -hmm. But under Xerxes, you're going to have three more battles. And he's, you know, in all this feasting and everything that we're seeing here as at the opening of the Book of Esther, he is 
prepping all of his men to go back and try and take Greece again. So he is going to actually win the Battle of Thermopylae, and this is where we actually have the legendary Spartans, the Grecian Spartans that defend that pass, and they are going to, they're not going to win the battle, they're going to be actually betrayed by Thessalonians, they're going to be attacked from behind, the Spartans are, but they are going to be responsible that the army is, is saved because they're going to hold off the Persians there, and they're they're lots going of movies to, made about that, right? And so Actually, these I haven't seen them. But, these Persian yeah. wars are are just famous famous times when the Persians are trying to to conquer Greece. They are going to lose that same year. They're they're going to win that one, but then they're going to lose the Battle of Salamis. Now you can see from this map here by the Aegean Sea that the Persian Empire. This is going to be quite a naval battle okay and and the battle of salamis they're going to go in there with 200 ships and you're going to have xerxes is is going to win the spartans and the spartans are going to get betrayed well this time xerxes is going to get betrayed and because the the most uh themistocles the uh naval uh commander for the greeks is going to send a message to xerxes and tell him that if that that this is all planned and if he will just attack they'll give the battle to it and xerxes is going to go ahead and attack and then themistocles is going to pull back and and lure the 200 persian ships into a channel and apparently the the greek ships are faster and more able to maneuver and so they are going to take out the Persian Navy here at the Battle of Salamis. And so um, they're going to lose 160 of their Persian ships there. This is going to be a huge naval defeat. And then the final battle is going to be the Battle of Plataea, and they're going to lose that one as well. And that, that one will be when the Greeks basically kick the Persians out, out of Greece. And of course, again, like we said, this is going to set the stage for Alexander the Great later. And all of this happens between Esther chapters 1 and 2 in a period of about four years. All right, so in Esther chapter 2, we're going to have the king is uh, Xerxes is going to come back from the Persian Wars and he's licking his wounds you might you you might say he's it's been a bad bad defeat and he is obviously going to want to come home and be comforted and, and and when he gets back you know there's no queen right okay and so of course you know the story they're going to send out across the land and and we're going to have all the beautiful maidens in the land come and and there's going to be a uh, beauty pageant or a, a competition for who will be the next queen. And then the king is in uh, Esther chapter 2, verse 17. The king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And thus the crown. Yes, right. We forgot to tell everybody. <laughs> Yes, we, we we dressed up for Esther because during Purim, which is the annual celebration of Esther's story and the we this when the Jews were saved from destruction at this time, they celebrate and dress up and it's kind of like Halloween because everybody dresses in costumes and it's kind of like Thanksgiving because they're all thankful that Israel has been saved and the Jews have been saved and it's kind of like Easter because they all give baskets to each other baskets of food and goodies and so it, it's quite um, a, a happy fun celebration every year in Israel and this is um, we'll, we'll see some pictures about it a little later but this is uh, one of the festivals one of the holidays of the Jews that is not one of the seven big ones that's commanded in the Bible you'll see that it's it's more of a patriotic Israel holiday and we'll actually get to that command to remember this day 
later on, and that is commanded in the book of Esther. And so the king is going to make a great feast, and everybody is going to welcome Queen Esther. Now, at this time, after she has become queen, Mordecai, who is her uncle, and we're, we're going to take a look at that in, in just a minute, how they're related, but he is the, works at the gate. And he is going to become privy to a plot against King Xerxes. And it says that um, we learn from the rabbis that the, the two that are plotting to take out a Hazarus, which is kind of like calling um, Xerxes Pharaoh or the king. A Hazarus is a, a title of an office. And so they plot to, to assassinate the king. And... There's going to be, Josephus says that there's a certain Pharnabasis, a slave of one of the conspirators that actually betrays their plot to Mordecai. Now, it's interesting that Mordecai doesn't just run to the king and tell him that there's a plot to assassinate him. He actually goes to Esther. He gets a message in to Esther and tells Esther to warn the king about this plot to assassinate him that's that's coming down and if you do your history here you'll see that in the case of Sennacherib you know we talked last time about Hezekiah and and the Sennacherib has to leave and go back to Assyria with the what's remains of the troops that were outside of the walls of Jerusalem Sennacherib is also going to get assassinated when he gets back to Assyria but there's going to be someone that dis discovers the plot there, and he tries to warn Sennacherib that his, actually his son, is going to try and assassinate him. And what happens is the one that finds out about the coup, he goes and tells the, the officials he, need to, he needs to talk to the king. Well, the officials um, are in on the plot. And so they take him, and because commoners are not supposed to look at the king unless the king extends permission for them to, they cover his head and they say, what are you, what are you here for? And he tells them that Sennacherib, there's a plot to kill Sennacherib. And what happens is when they take the blindfold off of him, he sees that he is he has not been brought to Sennacherib. He's been brought to his son that's planning to kill him. And so the one that's trying to inform about the plot is the one that gets killed. And so this is kind of news probably on the historical plate at this time. And so Mordecai doesn't know who to trust. Who can he tell that there's an assassination attempt? Okay, so this is what probably why he will go to Esther, the one he can trust, to get the message straight to, straight to Xerxes about this assassination right. attempt. Okay, and, and of course this um, is the, the assassins are going to be discovered. Big Ten and Teresh are going to get executed. They're going to be, um, it says that they'll be hanged in gallows. Um, in Ezra, we need to understand that in the Persian Empire, that's probably um, not a gallow like we would think of it today. It would probably be more like the stake or the posts that the Assyrians used when they impaled um, the bodies of, of people that they had conquered. And it was not an unusual method of execution as the Persians are, are going to be the forerunners to, to coming up with what we will come to know in the Roman period as crucifixion. Right. All right, so uh, as Darius... Xerxes' father was known to have impaled 3,000 men at, at one point in time. All right, so one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is why didn't this, why didn't Mordecai get thanked? I mean, he saved the king's life, and we have to wonder if there wasn't an anti-Semitism going on in the Persian court right there at that time because, um, was it prejudiceness? prejudice because he was Mordecai the Jew and he was openly uh, his nationality was openly known probably might be one of the reasons why Mordecai tells Esther 
not to, to make to reveal. Her, her nationality known, okay? So Esther is from the root word Hadassah, which in Hebrew is myrtle. And there's fun that you can have with that. But here in, in this slide, you can see that Haman is very angry that Mordecai refuses to bow to him. And um, there's a lot of reasons that that could be. Um, it's not a lot. Sometimes people think it's, it's because a Jew is not allowed to bow to anybody. But there's plenty of examples in the scriptures where Jewish people are bowing to show honor. And so that might not be it. In this case, it might be a kind of civil disobedience because Mordecai doesn't like Haman. And there, there might be something more to that than what, what we read on the surface. But, of course, you know the story that um, Mordecai, uh, hey, Haman is going to have a vendetta against Mordecai because Mordecai won't bow to him. Now, it's really important to know a little bit of genealogy on Mordecai. So here you can see that Mordecai's father is J.R. and J.R.'s brother is Abihel, and Abihel is Esther's father. So in Mordecai and Esther are actually cousins here, and they are related to each other. The other thing that's important to know is that Mordecai is descended from Shimei. So do you remember Shimei from King David? Shimei, when they come, when David comes into Jerusalem um, after Ishbosheth has tried to take the throne and everything, Shimei is the one that comes out and he's yelling and screaming. He's actually throwing rocks at David and saying, you're a bloody man. And, he, and, and Shimei is of the house of Saul. And so he is, is and, and David's general there, Abishai, is like, hey, David, let me go. I'll, I'll take his head off right now. He's, he's dishonoring the king. And David spares Shimei and says, no, don't. It might be a blessing that he's able to, to get his, vent his frustrations because, because I'm sad that Saul's family is is now been been slaughtered by by the armies that have have gone in. And so it's amazing here that Mordecai is going to be alive because of David's, David's grace. grace. David sparing him here. Okay? All right. There in in Xerxes court there are three houses that are generally, um, like we saw in Solomon's as well, there's going to be what's called the first house, and these are for virgins. And then when you have become part of the king's harem, then you now move up to the second house. That's where the concubines live. And then the third house is the king's residence. So that's, that's kind of helpful to know. We're going to read a verse in a minute where you'll see that. But also notice that the, these virgins that have been brought in to become brides for the king or to have that possibility go through 12 months of purification. Like it says that there's six months with oil and myrrh and then six months with sweet odors and yeah. everything. So this Very is... Very formal. The, yes, and, and this is um, going to play in. I, I think it's beautiful because it kind of is like her name, is, is Myrtle, the fragrant Myrtle. Um, we notice that the whenever the Jews tell the story of Esther during uh, Purim, they cheer and make lots of cheering and happy noises whenever we talk about Mordecai. And then they have what they're called groggers and noisemakers. They make a lot of noise every time. Kind of boo. They boo and hiss every time you say the name of Haman. And what they're trying to do is like drown him out. And so this is very, very traditional. When you tell the story of, of Esther that you cheer for Mordecai and you boo for Haman. So in Esther 2.14, it says that in the evening she went and on the morrow she returned into the second house. Because now she is part of 
the king's harem. She's part of the concubines of the women to the custody of the king's chamberlain and he who keeps cares for the concubines. And she came in unto the king no more except the king delighted in her. And then she was called by name. So you didn't go to the king um, into the third house unless you were summoned by the king. Okay, now let's just do a little background check on Haman. It says that in Esther chapter 3, after these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So who are the Agagites and who is Haman descended from? If you go back to Exodus, you're going to find out about the Amalekites. The Amalekites are descended from Esau. And we're in Exodus 17, we're clear back at Rephaim, where the rock split and the water came out. Okay, And of course, this is in a desert country. So part of the reason the Amalekites are going to attack Israel in Exodus 17 is they're going to say, hey, that water is mine. So it's water wars. Then came, it says in Exodus 17, then came Amalek who fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And you remember this is where they have to hold Aaron and her have to hold up his arms. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek. From generation to generation. So we're talking about those descendants of Esau that hate the Jewish people with an unending hatred. Kind of similar to today. Yes, and this is a very ancient hatred. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, when Moses is doing the, the remember everything that happened, listen to what he says. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when you were come forth out of Egypt. And then we're going to learn a detail here that they were actually attacking from the rear. They were killing the children, the grandparents, the weak, the frail. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindermost part, hindmost part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee. And when thou wast faint and weary, he feared not God. Therefore it shall be that when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven and thou shalt not forget it. So the Lord has declared war on these hate-filled descendants of Amalek who want to annihilate the Israelites. Right. All right? And then in 1 Samuel 15, you remember that we t saw that when Saul goes to battle with the Amalekites, that he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed the people. But God had commanded him to... Oh, bad blood. Right. He commanded him to take out the, out the Amalekites. And then look what he says. Agag is the king of the Amalekites. So who is Haman? He is an Agagite. He is a descendant of King Ahab. Agag. So uh, obviously some of the sons escape here. In, um, and then, of course, Samuel is going to kill King Agag. But it's kind of fascinating when you look <laughs> at the uh, at the, the, the kids' game. Hangman, you take that NG out, and we have Haman. And we have um, the an interesting game that we might play on Dora <laughs> that um, has roots down into, um, into Haman. All right. When Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not to him, nor did him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. So again, Haman wants to kill Mordecai, and not just Mordecai. Because of Mordecai not reverencing him, he is going to wipe 
out the Jews. He is going to to do a genocide against wants the Jews, to, yeah. or he wants to against the Jewish people. And we notice that here one clue that it actually says it a couple of times in the book of Esther, that Haman was full of wrath. And of course in Isaiah, wrath is a code name for your end time antichrist. And guess what your end time antichrist is going to try to do? Wipe them all out. Annihilate the Jewish people. So this is God ancient roots in here and we're going to see that in this ancient type in this end time type of israel haman is going to play the the role of a someone in the end time who is going to try and annihilate the jewish people now the day before it's been set that the the, the, well, actually, the day modernly today, the day before Purim is going to be a fast day. And they fast in commemoration of what Esther did before she went into Xerxes to try and get some help for the plot that Haman has against the Jewish people. In Esther chapter 4, it says, For if thou altogether, oh, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther telling her that she is going to have to approach Xerxes and let him know what's going on. It's pretty fascinating that here she is in the court, and it says in the scriptures that she hasn't seen um, King Xerxes for a month now. He hasn't called for her. And that doesn't necessarily mean she's not in favor. It just means he has a big harem. And for whatever reason, he ha he hasn't called her. They're... they're, they're um, it says that Mordecai tells her, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. And I love this because Mordecai doesn't even doubt that if Esther won't, can't help them, God will take care God of God will help from some other way. He knows the God in whom he trusts. But here he's telling Esther, but thou and thy father's house will be destroyed. So whether you go in and approach the king and he condemns you for not being called, or whether or not you don't approach him, eventually they're going to find out you're a Jew and you're going to get killed either way. Right. So he says, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And that... This is probably your most famous verses Lying in the story Esther, yeah. of, of Esther. Esther. Is who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And and I think about that a lot today. I know. Uh, have we not come chosen to, to come for such a time as this? Before the second coming, the grand finale of Jesus Christ's return to reign as king. And then he says, go gather together. And she, Esther says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So here, it's, it's very important to see in light of a Davidic covenant that the queen is willing to put her life on the line to save her people. This is important in the context of invoking a covenant of protection on a people that we've been talking about. So the fast of Esther then said the king unto her when she goes to approach him instead of condemning her, which he could have, the stress is relieved. He holds out the scepter and she is allowed to speak. And so at this point, her life isn't on the line anymore, but how is she going to approach the issue? How is she going to tell Xerxes that his right-hand man is kind of trying to pull the wool over his eyes 
when he got permission from Xerxes to do the, uh, the, the battle and take out the Jews, he presented the Jews as people that were disobedient to Xerxes, and he didn't even say who the people were. Xerxes doesn't even know which of the people in the kingdom. He, he has a lot of confidence in right. Haman. You know, he's given him his signet ring, and, and he doesn't even ask questions. He just tells Haman, you just go take care of it. And so the king says unto Esther, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? And it shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. And I love that line because it really wasn't meaning that he was going to give her half the kingdom. It was an idiom that meant whatever you want, you can have it. So I, I, I just think that would be kind of cute if, you know, if it's your wife's birthday or something, you know, and, and you, you say, what do you want? You know, you can say, I'll give you half, even unto half the kingdom. And that's just kind of funny because that's just an idiom that means, you know, I'm happy to give you whatever you want. So, of course, she invites him to the banquet. And then they have, um, and then at that banquet, she ends up inviting him to a second banquet. She doesn't tell him what it is. And you, you just wonder, why the second banquet? And so, do you have an idea? Well, it's the stage, the setting she's looking for. Well, so he maybe he was in a bad mood, or maybe uh, some of the conjectures are she lost her nerve. <laughs> she didn't, she did. Or maybe the setting, like you said, wasn't perfect. Maybe uh, the throne room was too public. The scene might backfire. Only Haman was to be present. The timing was imperfect. And whatever the case was, she decided not to ask him at that time, but to ask him to come to another banquet. Now, again, we're back to the rabbis that there is a coincidence is not a kosher word because it's what will happen that night that's going to un unravel the whole plot and the whole story because of course because of course that night king xerxes can't sleep and the rabbis teach that the angels actually were keeping him awake so that he couldn't sleep and he's going to ask that the history be read and of course it just so happens by chance that they just happen to read the story of Mordecai. Now, King Haman went home from that first banquet, and he was like bragging to his whole family how important he was, and he was finally going to have uh, the, right. his, his chance to, to take care of that Mordecai. He was going to get rid of him. As a matter of fact, he actually built a gallows. 75 feet high to That's a high hang gallows. yeah a gallows to hang Mordecai now whether it was a stake or you know an impalement whatever but he is going to murder Mordecai and and he plans to present this to the king and he's super feeling like he's going to have the opportunity to get his revenge on Mordecai but that very night the people the the servants are going to read to Xerxes the story of how Mordecai sir, saved his life. Right. And we're going to find out that not only was it an oversight, the king, the king's like, how, how come nobody ever did anything for Mordecai for saving my life? Not only was it an oversight, it was against the Persian law to not reward someone who has saved the king. And so the fact that he is going to to be read that night is, is going to change the whole flavor of what happens the next day. And in the book of Esther, it's actually studied as a literary masterpiece because of its irony, of because of its plot reversal. Of it, it's it's a, a beautiful piece of literature that is going to show everything that you expect is going to get reversed. And so the scripture in Psalm says, Behold, 
He travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit, and he digged it, and is fallen into the ditch which he made. And that's how covenants work. If you bear false witness against someone else, and that you're found to have borne false witness, what was going to happen to the person you accused is what happens to you. Yeah, that, gotcha. That's how covenants work. So here Haman is digging a pit, so to say, or building a gallows. And if he is be, bearing false witnesses, if he is wrong, then by law, what he was planning for the other person is going to happen to him. And you're going to see this throughout the book of Esther. So, his mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate, or the top of his head. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So, just so you get a flavor of this, in the Old Testament, we've already seen several cases of this principle happening, that you reap what you sow, that you plan something for somebody else and it happens to you. How about this one? Jacob killed an animal and lied to his father, Isaac, pretending to be Esau. Years later, Jacob's sons killed an animal and lied to him, pretending that Joseph was dead. Okay. Pharaoh gave orders to drown the Jewish baby boys. One day, his army is drowned in the Red Sea. David secretly took his neighbor's wife and committed adultery. David's own son, Absalom, took his father's concubines and openly committed adultery with them. Saul of Tarsus encouraged the stoning of Stephen. And when he became Paul the missionary, he was stoned in Lystra. <laughs> So it's, it's fascinating to, to see that this is a principle that what you plan for someone else will come on your own head. What goes around comes around. What goes around comes around, okay? <laughs> so the definition of irony is that it's a contrast between what is expected and what actually happens. So you're going to see in the book of Esther that this is, the whole book is a grand irony. Mordecai whom Haman hated, had to be honored by him at the very time that he planned to supervise Mordecai's impalement. It totally flips. He who wanted respect from Mordecai had to give respect to Mordecai. Of course, you remember the story, right? Sure. He, he, the king, Xerxes, the next morning, he Seems asked pretty, Mordecai, yeah. What do you do for someone the king wants to honor? <laughs> and Haman, of course, thinks that it's himself. himself. So he, he makes up this beautiful elaborate plan. <laughs> and, and then he ends up it. Here we go with the irony. It's flipping on his head. Early in the morning, Mordecai publicly grieved for his own people. But later that evening, Haman privately grieved over his own humiliation. Right. Okay. Haman was degraded just when he thought he had reached the goal of his ambition. He perished at the very stake that he had erected for his enemy. Right. So, he, so the difference between what's expected and what... Kind of an end time scenario. Actually, ha yeah, kind of. Let's talk about it right now. Let's talk about the story of Esther as a type. All right. You have a Hitler-like attempt to exterminate the Jews. Esther, on the other hand, was willing to give her life to save her people. Haman is exalted while Mordecai is hated. Mordecai is honored while Haman is brought low. All of these things are a type of what will happen in the end time as this end time figure tries to wipe out the Jews and God comes to the rescue. The whole story of Esther is a type. Haman celebrates celebration of his own ascension to power 
turns to his own death sentence. Think about that when the Antichrist surrounds Jerusalem. It's his, they're celebrating the death of the two witnesses in Jerusalem. It's their celebration will turn to his own death sentence. Right. Because Esther's darkest hour turns to light. When she goes in to, to with her life on the line that she could be killed, the king hears her and the story begins to flip around. Haman's motive was hatred and plunder. King Xerxes told him that he could distribute the plunder from the killing of these people that were not faithful to him. Okay, so Haman is... And you think about it, because Xerxes is coming back from this huge losses in the Persian Wars, so he's probably financially strapped. The idea that Haman's going to go out and bring in money to the coffers, to these this people that are, are not honoring the king, is, is sounds good to Xerxes, okay? Notice that when the Jews, in the end of the story, are allowed, although they're allowed by the decree of of Xerxes when he tells them that they'll be allowed to fight if anybody attacks them on uh, at when this other decree is allowed to happen, it says that although they are allowed to take the plunder from their enemies, they do not take plunder. So the messages here are not selfish. We talked in your last class about um, Lance and his um, the Hopi prophecies, and he actually had a near-death experience and wrote a book called The Message. And most people, many people are probably familiar with that. It's an awesome near-death experience. But in The Message, when Lance goes to heaven, and sees the functioning of Zion there. It's so beautiful that he says that the most important aspect of Zion is that they serve one another. Everyone is trying to save and help and attend to the opposite of selfishness. other people. It's the exact opposite of what Haman represents. And we're going to see that more in detail when we look at a literary structure going on with Haman's ten sons in a little while. Haman's wife, Zeresh, and the others encourage him to build the gallows. So Haman's not alone. He's got a people behind him pushing for power, pushing to annihilate the Jews. And then Esther, on the other hand, her people are fasting and praying with her. Haman has vast property and wealth and hopes to confiscate the Jews' property. But in the end time, Esther and Mordecai receive Haman's house and his lands. Think about that in the inheritances that Jesus Christ will give the saints as they inherit the earth when Haman representing the end time opposition, Satan and the Antichrist, They're trying to take the earth for their own, and it will flip on their heads. Haman and his allies attempt to eradicate the Jews in one fell blow. We're going to see that Haman's ten sons die simultaneously. And we're going to take a look at that. The Jews have a, a fascinating tradition about Haman's ten sons that we're about to take a look at. But here, before we go to that, behold from Psalms, He that keeps Israel shall never slumber or sleep. Haman, the one that had the power of death, has been destroyed. But men are in danger of something far worse than temporal destruction. God hath made him to be sin for us. Speaking of Jesus Christ, God hath made him to be sin. For us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And is not that the grandest irony of scripture is that Jesus Christ was made sin for us. But the king holds out his scepter to pardon us. 
by His grace. All right, so on the Feast of Purim, the synagogue reader reads the ten names of Haman's son in, in one breath. You have to do this in one breath. And I challenge any of you guys to, to read the names of Haman's son them, right? in one breath. I'm going to probably slaughter the pronunciations. But anyway, they, they traditionally they do this because all of the sons of Haman died together. Okay. Now, in the Hebrew text... There is a, they're listed in a remarkable way. They're listed in a column, and there's a reflexive uh, pronoun there that's in front of each of their names that has the idea that it's self. And so these Persian names are have this self pronoun paired up with them. Okay, so we have Parshandatha, which is the curious self. Or the busybody. We have Dauphin, which is the weeping self, self pity. We have Asparta, which is the assembled self, self mobilized, self sufficiently. We don't need God, we, we do it ourselves. We've got Paratha, which is the generous self, spend thriftiness, impulsive self, and indulgence. He, he indulges himself. So you have to take each of these and it, it's taking the negative side of it, the selfish side of it. Adalia is the weak self. It's self-consciousness, inferiority complex. It's the, um, it's the other end of the pride cycle. There's the pompous side and there's the worthless side. And it's all pride. because it's self-focus. It's all a focus on self instead of God who gave his life for all of us. None of us are worthy on our own, only through him. And so it is the weak self, the inferiority complex. Um, we have Aridatha, which is the strong self, assertiveness, insistence on one's own way. And Parmasta, the preeminent self, ambition, desire for preeminence over others. By the way, that's Haman. To a T. Then we have Arisei, which is a bold self, imprudence, and Eridei, a dignified self, pride, haughtiness, sense of superiority, and then the worst one of all, the last one, Veshatha, the pure self, self righteousness. And so what's amazing here is that. The, sons, the, the death of the sons of Haman. Here we have a picture of selfishness, all of its variations and shades and forms, all being destroyed at once in one breath. Hmm. All right. When Esther came back before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he had devised against the Jews, that decree that he allowed Haman to just do whatever he wanted and make a decree that they would kill all of the Jews on Adar 14. Um, he commanded by letters um, that they, against the Jews, that this should return on his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur, which means the casting of lots, because it was Haman that cast lots to decide when to kill all the Jews. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and all that which he had, they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. So in Shushan, actually, after the Jews had actually won, um, the king asks Esther, what, what else can I do for you? And she tells him, give us one more day in the capital of Shushan, because this is where the anti-Semitism hub was. And many of those that had actually helped Haman foment this plot had gone into hiding. And so now that they had won the battle, they wanted another day to, to root out those that had planned it all and to have them come to justice. And so 300 more 
men are going to be found and executed on the second day. That's why there's two days. And to this day, they celebrate two days of Purim in, um, in Jerusalem, but one day and everywhere else. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial perish from their, from their seed. So Purim is going to have several things now traditionally that, that they dress up. We talked about that. They dress up in all the different characters and do plays and all kinds of things regarding the story of Esther. You can see they have the, the tree. They call those Haman's hats. Um, that's the translation of them. And, you, of course, they're a shortbread with, with different flavored fillings inside. You would probably like that. You like um, fruity <laughs> type fillings and, and cookies and stuff. You can see that they have alcohol. So you remember that Xerxes throws these big parties and uh, they all drink at these parties. And so there's actually a lot of drinking associated with the holiday of Purim. And then you can see the noisemakers where they blot out Haman's name and um, and then the baskets. They they almost look like Easter baskets, right? And these are baskets of goodies and foods that they bring to, hmm. to everyone at the Feast of Purim. So um, again, like we said earlier, this is not one of the seven biblical feasts that are prophetic, but we can see that it is kind of prophetic. So my question is, why didn't God ordain this feast and particularly this one and Hanukkah? Why are they not part of the big seven? Pick me. Pick me. Pick no. me. Yes, I'm picking you. <laughs> because it's not an appointment he has with the earth. Right. The, his appointments are when he's coming. These two feasts, Hanukkah is when, you know, Antichus Epiphanes came in and slaughtered the Jews and put a pig on the altar. These are pictures of the Antichrist. They're pictures of, of deliverances and yeah. And so they're dedication. prophetic, but they're not Jesus's appointments. Right. But they're they not still direct. they still are very prophetic. And um, now what we want to do is you know the name Esther means hidden, and we want to look in and see why why Luther and Calvin were not right. Esther should not be removed to the from the Bible, <laughs> and it does honor God. And he does it by using acrostics. You have to go back into the Hebrew language. And remember, we've talked about it before, that there's a lot of things in the Hebrew that are lost when you translate it into English, right? Sure. And so one of the, the tricks that they, they used to use was called an acrostic. Everybody's probably familiar with the fact that in Hebrew, Psalms 119 is... All 22 verses are 22 letters of the alphabet. Actually, there's three sets of them. And they go through A. It would be in English, it would be like starting the first verse with A, the second verse with B, the second, third verse with C, and going through the alphabet and then doing that um, three times. This is called an acrostic. And in the book of Esther, we're, we're not going to take a lot of time because we're we, we need to wrap her up. But I just wanted to show you that in verse one chapter one verse 20 when it's talking about queen vashti if you take the first letter of the words in that verse you will spell yod he vav he now i want you to notice that the it's, hidden it's, name of god yeah. hebrew goes from right to left so this time it's being spelled backwards it's being spelled the way we would spell it in english from left to right so we have yod he vav he backwards in this verse in the second one, which is in chapter 5, verse 4, it's the banquet, and, and uh, it's when Esther invites the king and Haman to the banquet. You can see that we have an acrostic with yod hey vav hey, but this time it's going up. This time it's going the right way. It's going from the Hebrew way. The Hebrew way. Okay, so we right. would call that forward, right? Right. Okay, so in chapter 5, verse 13, which is Haman gloating, Okay, we have it backwards again. We have another acrostic with the name of God, yod Hey, That's what we said. Um, Calvin and Martin Luther said that there's no mention of God in the book of Esther. Well, it, Esther means hidden. You have to know where to look. Right. And you have to do That's it in a Hebrew text. Okay. 
All right, so the fourth acrostic is in chapter 7, verse 7, and it is formed um, when Haman comes to an end, and this one is moving forward again. We could say a lot more about it, but but just notice that there's a pattern here. We have um, the in, one is formed with the initial letters because it's moving uh, forward, and the other, the final letters, is moving backwards, and you have the four different accounts that we just took a look at. And in two cases where the name is spelled backwards, it is God overruling the council of Gentiles. Right. And then I can kind of see that. Yeah. And the two cases where it's spelled forward, it is God ruling directly in behalf of his own people. Okay. So there's a pattern there, but look at the way it kind of goes. It goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards between Gentiles and Israelites. And, and like I said, we could get a lot deeper into this, but what I wanted you to see was this pattern. In 1 Nephi 13, it says, For there is one God and one shepherd over all the earth, and the time cometh that he shall manifest himself unto all nations, both unto the Jews, which he did at his first coming, and also unto the Gentiles, that was the time of the Gentiles. And after he has manifested himself to the Jews and the Gentiles, then... He will manifest himself to the Gentiles in the end time. And then they will take it back to the Jews. And look what he says. And the last, the last where the Gentiles the first go around, will be first in the end time. And the first will be last. And you can see that these acrostics are kind of playing that same kind of game in, in there. Now the fifth acrostic. And I'm only going to show you eight places in, in Esther where the name of God is hidden. But in the fifth acrostic, which is in chapter 7, verse 5, it is a different name. It is Yod, I'm mean, Hey, Yod, Hey, Aleph, which is Hey, Ya! Oh, I no. am! Hey, Ya! Okay, it, it is, is formed by the final letters. And it's spelled backwards. So what is the context of this? This appears at the dramatic moment when the king seeks the identity of who is trying to kill Esther by saying, who is he? Where is he? That there's presume in his heart to do so. So look at this prophetically. In the end time, when I am stands and says, who is he? And where is he that durst presume in his heart to wipe out my people? I am is hidden in the text right there. Now, just a couple of other places to show you that, that we're not making this up, that this happens actually. There's several places. I only picked two more because for the sake of time. This is at the epitaph at the cross. You remember that they, that Pilate is going to write Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And he's going to do it in three languages. And he's going to do it on the, on the cross. And when the Jews see this epitaph above Jesus, they're going to say, No, don't write that. Take it down. Don't say that he's king of the Jews. Say that he, he claimed to be king of the Jews or something. What was their big issue? with the way that Pilate had written this epitaph on the cross. It makes you wonder if he did it on purpose. yod heh vav -he, that's There awesome. it is in an acrostic. yod heh vav -he. Jehovah. Written above Jesus on the cross. All right, so the last three that I want to show you real quick in the book of Esther, and, and these are from Chuck Misler's book, Cosmic Codes. I showed you... Uh, earlier a slide that that had his book there and so he's yeah absolutely he's the one that I'm taking this information from on these hidden things in the book of Esther um, the last one we're going to talk about is equidistant letter sequencing or ELSs and there's you know there's debate we've over, done that a little before yeah, yeah and there's debate over how valid it is because there's certain letter sequences that might happen that are random Okay, but there are, I, I'm going to show you one that's going to blow your mind. Did you say nothing's around? So. Yeah, we just said coincidence wasn't a kosher word. And that's that right. chance yeah. is just God working undercover, like in Ruth and in Esther. But 
notice this example that Chuck Misler gives us. He says, he, he gives us this little message to read, and, and he's going to tell us that the code is that every fourth letter is going to be the code. And now it says, Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. So when you look at what we just read, and we pick out every fourth letter, read the code. it says read the code. And Pretty so cool. that, that's just a simple example. So you get the idea of what equidistant letter sequencing is. And of course, really common words, you're, you know, it's more possible that you'd find those common letters um, more frequently than others. But let me show you one that they calculate that the odds that this could happen are about 70 million to one. Hmm. Okay. And I'm going to show you this one because we have been... I mean, our whole website is www.propheticappointments.com. We're all about the seven appointments that the Lord has made with the earth that are pictured in these seven feasts of the Lord that he gives us in Leviticus 23. So the, they say that the Jews' catechism is his calendar. His whole faith is, is based around the rehearsals of his calendar. Okay, that we call the appointed times. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, you know that the word for seasons is Moedim. Is Moedim, okay? And it means appointed time. So these appointed times are right there in Genesis 1 14. Now, the appointed times on a Jewish calendar, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, we kind of went through this a little once before, but when I went through Leviticus, but that's cool. Really good. Okay, so we're getting, but what I'm about to show you is, is, is pretty two. amazing. Yes, layer two. So if you go and, and you do the 52 Sabbaths, because there's 52 weeks in a year, and you do the seven days of Passover and one day for the holiday of Shavuot, one day for Feast of Trumpets, one day for Day of Atonement, seven days for the Feast of Tabernacles, and then one day for the eighth great day. The total of the Sabbath days is 70. Hmm. And so 70, and we've been talking about Daniel and not keeping the Sabbaths. They're taking captivity 70 years. This is just, you know, threaded all throughout prophecy. But 70 God becomes... God loves numbers. I know, right? It's like 70 becomes kind of a marker of appointed times. Okay, these Moedi. All right, now, statistically, we would expect that in the whole book of Genesis, there are 78,064 letters. So we would expect that randomly Moedi uh, would come up five times. Best case scenario, okay? As it is, there is only... One equidistant letter sequence in Genesis where Moedim shows up. And guess what the interval is between the letters? Yeah, it's obvious. It's 70. Right. And guess what it's centered in, the center of the Moedim letters? The verse that describes it. It's the verse that talks about the Moedim. Yeah. Okay? Odds against this being by unaided chance has been estimated greater than 70 million to one. So these kind of fingerprints of God are throughout scripture, like Isaiah 53. Number one, when Isaiah wrote that <laughs> amazing, amazing, we, we often call it the heart of the book of Isaiah because it's the passage of the suffering servant where Jesus says that he was, well, where Isaiah says that the Messiah was wounded for our transgressions and that by his stripes we are healed and it's probably one of the most famous passages of isaiah but this was written 700 bc 700 years before the cross but encoded in isaiah 53 in the hebrew is all of the names that you see on the screen messiah nazarene galilee Shiloh, Pharisee, Levites, Caiaphas, Annas, Passover, all of these, the atonement lamb, Obed, Jesse, seed, water, all of these words 
are equidistant letter sequences that can be are embedded in Isaiah 53. But check this out. So are the names of every person that the scriptures list was at the foot of the cross. That's pretty incredible. Mary is listed three times. Guess how many Marys there were? Three. James and James were listed. Two Jameses. The third James wasn't converted till after the crucifixion. So James is there twice. Now here's the amazing thing. There's one name that has actually pretty common letters that, that, that you might expect to find in Isaiah 53. But there's one name that's missing. Do you know what name it is? I'm going to guess, even though I don't know. Okay, what is it? Judas. That's right. Judas is not there. That's the one that you would expect to find. It's more percentage-wise. Because wise, the letters right? in the name of Judas is more likely, and it's not there. <laughs> Only the people that were at the cross. That was 700 years before the event happened. Okay, so here's some equidistant letter sequences in Esther. We've got in Esther chapter 1 verse 3 an equidistant letter sequence at the interval of 8 spelling out Messiah. In 4 verse 7 we have an equidistant letter sequence at the interval of 8 spelling out Yeshua. The fun the fun thing about all this and I love the way Chuck puts it but I, the fun thing about all this is it's not so much that that this has great big spiritual message in it as it is that it's the fingerprint of God saying and the prophetic it's marker. authenticating yeah. the word of God. It's it, I you know saying okay, let me just show you how perfect this work is. Right. <clears throat> and then in Esther four verse two, we have El Shaddai, the Almighty. And there's actually some fun ones about Haman and stuff, but I, I want to wrap this up. So I want to move on to the Davidic kings and queens in Isaiah 49 in the end time. The kings and the queens of the Gentiles. It was Esther's interceding at the throne that saved the people of Israel from slaughter. And I love this because here you have a case of a queen invoking a Davidic covenant. On her people. The queen is faithful to God. The people are faithful to the queen. And the people are saved. Mm. Okay? That's beautiful because it shows you that it doesn't have to be a he. Exactly. And I love this. It says, no, I want you to notice throughout, through, as we're talking about Daniel and Ezekiel and all this, you remember we talked about how Moses prayed for his people after they worshipped the golden calf. He prayed before God that if he would forgive their sins, he would he would even have his name taken out of the book of life if he would save them. And, you know, God told him, you can't do that, but I can. <laughs> and uh, notice this. I have executive privilege. <laughs> Apostle Paul said that he would be, this is what he says in Romans 9, I would, that he was willing to be accursed from Christ, separated from his Christ, if it would help save unbelieving Israel. Wow. I love what Chuck said. He says, I love you, but I don't love you that much. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, you know, as I sit and think about that, I often remember in our training to be rescue divers, they said, what's the first rule of rescue diving? And they said, save yourself. Well, this is opposite. Yeah. This is the opposite of, of the principles that, you know, you don't save yourself necessarily first. You try to save others. On Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed for disobedient Israel. In the palace, Nehemiah prayed for the Jews in Jerusalem. Ezra wept and prayed and asked God to help his sinful people. And Daniel humbled himself and fasted and prayed that he might understand what God's plan was for Israel. Isaiah 62, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. That's awesome. So Mordecai's challenge to Esther was, for such a time as this, 
Little did Esther dream of the opportunity that would open to her. But the hour came for her, and she succeeded. We, too, must wisely use the present today. And when our hour of opportunity comes, we will be ready to speak or to strike or to suffer or to save. People ask us all the time, so what do we do with all this stuff, with these prophecies? For such a time as this, we were called to just be faithful every day. Yeah, that's Just beautiful. Her. I love the connection there that it is such a time as this. And when you think about prophetically everything that's happening, the times, the seasons, everything we see, no. For such a time as this, we are here. So go I. Anyway. And you. So, hopefully, once this again, is a blessing and thank give you, you encouragement for the yeah. great things that are going to happen. I love the close of that message. It's so beautiful. Rise up and be counted. And thank you so much. We're glad to have taken another opportunity to to share with you the love of our life, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll see you next time. And we'll see you next time.